My name is Scott. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I want to welcome you also if you're new or uh, first time here to Blue Oaks. I would love to meet you. I'll be hanging out in the courtyard praying it's warmer after the service at the new guest table. And if you have a moment and just uh, wouldn't mind stopping, would love to just uh, introduce myself, meet you. We have a gift for you because, you know, Christmas never really ends. So um, would love to see you after the service. So speaking of Christmas, uh, this was a bit of a changing Christmas for uh, my family. My wife and I, uh, this is our second Christmas married. We have a blended family of seven. I have three kids. She has two kids. But it was the first Christmas where we were all together. Uh, Last Christmas, kids were various different places and couldn't come home and all that kind of stuff. So this year, all seven of us were together. And um, it was an interesting one because you had two families that had traditions and now suddenly we're a family. And so some of it, what I mean by that is, so my wife's family has a tradition of they all meet at my mother-in-law's house Christmas Eve night. There's a big dinner. There's gift giving and all that kind of stuff. And so leading into Christmas, I'm smart enough to know this. I said, hey, just remember, um, <clears throat> I'm a pastor. I work on Christmas Eve. <laughs> That's a work day for me. That's a really long work day for me. She's like, oh, well, you know, what time do you think, you know, you're going to get out of there? And I'm like, oh, it's going to be late. And, I, and we were kind of bummed going into Christmas Eve thinking, I'm probably not even going to make it to family dinner. And, you know, my kids are, are with their mom and us. Well, hey, good story. We got cleaned up really quick Christmas Eve night, and I made it to dinner, won some points. So that was a good thing with everybody. But it was kind of like this, oh, we got to shift this. Um, my daughter, I'm taking her, so it was great having all the kids home. They're all back to their lives now, that kind of stuff. I'm taking my daughter yesterday to uh, meet up with some friends. She's headed up to a festival somewhere. And she says this to me on the way. She goes, yeah, Dad, it was kind of sad Santa didn't show up this year. And I kind of looked. I was like, huh? And then it clicked. A tradition my kids had growing up, this goes back to when I was a kid, stockings. How many do stockings on Christmas morning? Okay, see, stockings, when I grew up, stockings is what Santa brought, because all the tr- presents were under the tree. And if I'm blowing up some poor kid child who's in here right now, your Christmas story, I'm sorry, but that's on your parents for perpetuating the whole story to you, okay? But, but stockings are what Santa always brought. Well, this year, and it's probably a couple different reasons, you know, we figured we'll have the kids, like, secret Santa each other with stockings. And last year, one of the stockings literally took, like, six, six months to get to the person, and so this year, we got kind of late in the game. Well, we didn't have any stockings. It didn't even occur to me until my daughter was like, yeah, it's kind of sad. Santa didn't show up this year. And she was kind of half joking, half very serious. But it was a shifting of traditions. And my wife and I even talked about, hey, moving forward, we're not even sure what Christmas is going to look like because all of our kids are out of the house. And, you know, at some point in time, there's going to be significant others and other families. There's already other families, and then there's more families. And all kinds. I mean, who knows if we'll ever even all be together at a Christmas again. And it got me thinking about traditions, and because traditions are, you know, those things, it kind of gives us a sense of stability, a sense of the known, a routine, of, uh, of belonging, like there's this thing we're a part of, and maybe it's bigger than ourselves, or we know it happens every year. And when changes happen to that sometimes, it can be a little unsettling depending upon personality. Or just the season of, okay, it's shifting. What was is changing and becoming something new. Well, what I want us to look at this morning is how that very thing happened with our understanding of worship. What worship was and a shift, a change it went through to what our understanding of worship needs to be today. And let me just say this at the very beginning. When I say worship, I mean so much more than just the songs that we sing. Our our understanding of worship can sometimes get a little limited to just like, oh, it's song. Worship is so much more than that. But we see in the Old Testament, you know, the, the first half of the Bible where you get the story of God and his people, there were always three things associated with Worship. There are three things that you could say, man, if I do these things, I can draw this circle around this event and say, yes, I've worshiped. And the three things were this. There was always a place. There was always somewhere you went. And and it could be, it was various different things at different times. For a while early on, there would be altars that they would build. You know, God had done something in a particular place and they would build an altar there and there'd be some sacrifices and they'd say, you know, we worshiped here because this is where God did this. 
Then you move into the story of when the Israelites are leaving Egypt and they're traveling through the, the desert trying to get to the promised land. And eventually worship became centered around a tent, a tabernacle. And they would travel with it, but that was the place that they worshiped. When they finally settled in Jerusalem, a temple was built, that became the place. But there was always a place. You know, for us, it's Foothill High School. And every, here's what I tell the seminary: every Sunday is one Sunday closer to our permanent home. So there's this, let's file that one away, okay? So that, some of you are excited, some of you are like, huh, okay. Anyway, but there's a place, all right? So the second thing is, there was always a posture. You always see there was a posture associated with worship. Often it was, you know, bow down before the Lord, or sometimes, you know, hands are raised, and that happens sometimes in here, and some of you are, like, really comfortable, and others, you know, of you, when somebody raises their hand, you're like, whoa, what's happening right now? You know, but it's an expression. It's a physical expression of worship. You would see it sometimes it's lying prostrate on the ground before God, but there was a posture that would be associated with worship. And the third is this. There was a presentation. In the Old Testament, you read, when you came to worship God, you brought something with you. And it could be something as simple as, you know, uh, part of your harvest, something you had grown. I'm going to bring, you know, the first fruits you may have heard or read at some point in time. Sometimes it was an animal. It was a sacrificial system. And so you'd bring an animal to be sacrificed. And I've said this before, but I'm just so thankful I live now and not then because I don't do blood well or anything like that. And that just, I'm not sure how that would have gone for me, quite honestly. But that's what you would bring. You would bring something with you and you would leave it there on the altar. And that was worship, a place, a posture, and a presentation. And you could literally, like I said, you could draw a circle around an event and say, okay, I worship, that's what I did. Well, with the coming of Christ, this began to shift. This began to change. And we see, you know, we just celebrated the birth of Christ, right? And what's interesting is you see these very things involved even in the birth of Christ. We have the story of the three Magi. Some of you may have heard the phrase, you know, it's the wise men. But the the three Magi who come, they come to worship Jesus. And we're told they're following this star and they're trying to find out where are we going. And they ask, where's the king of the Jews going to be born? Oh, it's in Bethlehem. All right. And they're navigating, following. Eventually the star stops and they go, this is where they show up to worship. And Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says this. On coming to the house, they, the Magi, saw the child, Jesus, with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold frankincense, and myrrh. So do you see the pattern? You have the place. They show up at the house Jesus is in. They have the posture. They bow down to worship him, which at this time, Jesus is probably too. So just picture that one. Because those of us who've had two-year-olds, you're picturing this scene going, wow, how'd that go? You know, as the kid just like sitting there going, thank you, thank you. Or is he like pulling hands? You know, who knows what? But they bow down and worship him. And then they had a presentation. They brought gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we see these three things even associated within the birth of Christ. But Jesus is now going to begin to shift our concept and our understanding of worship. And 30 some odd years, you know, a little over 30 years later, he has an encounter with a woman. It's recorded for us in the book of John. John is one of the guys who walked with Jesus. He's one of the disciples of Jesus. And so he has this first-hand account, and he wrote five, five books of the New Testament, four of them named John. So apparently he's not a really good with titles, you know, but at least you know, and then, you know, wrote Revelation. So, but he has, he records this encounter Jesus had that, that he was a witness to. And in this encounter, we're going to see where Jesus radically shifts and changes our understanding of worship. So we're going to be in John chapter 4. We'll have the scriptures up on the screen. Some of you may not know this. We actually have a, a church app. And if you download the Blue Oaks app, you can open it up and you know, click uh, sermon notes, I think it says, and it'll bring up the scripture for you. And you can follow along that way too and take notes if you want. But we'll have it up on the screen. And so John chapter 4, we have this story. And it says, He, Jesus, left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. Now, how many of you on a journey have intentionally avoided something? Avoided a place or whatever? Like, how many of you use Waze? 
You know, the map, I, ma- I don't know how we survived without maps on our phone and stuff like that. But, but Waze is great. You know, you can enter the address and you can, you can tell Waze, I want to avoid certain things. Like, I don't want to go on toll roads. I don't want to go on dirt roads. Here's one of the functions you can even put in Waze. Waze has, you can put in, I do not want to go in any high-risk areas. High-risk is defined as high crime areas. Now, I don't know how they're defining that, and that sounds like a whole troubled area you can get into right there, but you can literally enter that in your map. Like, I do not want to go, and even if there's a direct route, Waze will then take you in a roundabout way so that you avoid those different things. Well, what's immediately interesting about this story is we're told Jesus is on this journey, but he has to go through Samaria. Now, Jews and and the Samaritans, this is unheard of because Jews did not travel through Samaria. There's ethnic hatred here, and and it goes back for generations because at one point in time when the Jews had been taken captive and and most of them had been moved out of the land, some of them remained, and other nations, other people groups moved in. And over time, you know, you have an intermingling, right? And then there's marriages, and then there's children and stuff like this. So when the Jews who had been exiled came back, they now looked at these people as sort of half-breeds. You're not fully Jewish, you're not even really Jewish because you've married. You've intermingled with these other people. And it became sort of this, this ethnic hatred. You could almost imagine it like modern day, the Turks and the Kurds in northern Syria. where there's, It's not even like there's love lost. There's just extreme hatred and animosity to the point where Josephus, who's a, a, a first century Jewish historian... He would, uh, would write different accounts of what would happen between these two. And, and one of the accounts he gave is, at one time, the Samaritans went into the Jewish synagogue in Jerusalem and just threw uh, human bones all around the synagogue, which if you know anything about the Jewish religion, that's like one of the worst things you can do, desecrate their synagogue. And in retaliation, the Jews went and would burn down Samaritan villages. So this kind of gives you an idea of the relationship between these two people. So for Jesus to go the most direct route, which was through Samaria, was unheard of. But what's interesting in what we just read, it said he had to pass through. One translation says this, he needed to go through. You see, Jesus, the disciples, and I wonder how that conversation went. Hey, guys, we're going, we're going to take this road. Whoa, Jesus, you know where that road leads, right? Like, we need to go this way. Jesus, no, we got to go. Because Jesus knew, I'm on my way to meet somebody. And this has to happen. This is going to happen. So we're told in verse 6, he eventually makes it to Jacob's well. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. Now it's about noon. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, there's some details in here you you can't just blow by, you can't skip. And the first is this. Jesus sits down at this well midday, noon. And this woman shows up, probably surprised to find anybody there. And the reason the time is important is because in this time, you didn't go to draw water out of the well in the middle of the day. That's the heat of the day. You go early in the morning. You go later in the evening when it's cooler, where, you know, the physical labor of pulling it out, you're not going to exhaust yourself as much because of the heat. So she's showing up thinking, why is anybody even here? But why is she showing up in the middle of the day? We don't know all the reasons why, but this woman, because of something in her life, she's on the sidelines of society. She doesn't get to go draw with the other woman from the town. She has to go and she knows nobody else is going to be there because there's something in her life that has sidelined her from society. And now she shows up and here's this guy asking her for a drink of water and she's like, wait, you're asking me. Are you not, like, I'm a Samaritan woman. You're obviously a Jewish man. Why would you ask me for a drink of water? And Jesus says to her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, 
He gets a little Seinfeldian here, and I think I just made up that word. But Seinfeldian, you know, Seinfeld, some of us actually watched Seinfeld when it was on TV, and then some of you are like, oh, yeah, I've watched all the episodes on Netflix. So there's the generational gap right there for you, okay? But there was the Seinfeld episode where they were talking in the third person. George is not happy right now. And, you know, whenever somebody's talking in the third person, it's kind of weird. Jesus is kind of talking in the third person right here. And he responds back to her and says, if you knew who was asking, you would actually ask him. And, you know, I kind of wonder sometimes, is the woman looking around going, um, it's just you and me. <laughs> I don't know who else you're talking about here. But he says to her, you would ask, if you knew the gift of God, you would be asking me. Now, we just, you know, this week, it was the season of gift giving, right? And my wife and I are, are kind of different on the whole gift Giving thing, like gift giving is not, uh, it's not a gift of mine. It's not a talent of mine. It's not a love language of mine. It gives me anxiety. And she loves gift giving. But we're also very different on the receiving end because on the receiving end, I love the surprise of a gift. You know, like who doesn't walk around a tree going, oh, that's a good size box. I wonder what it could be in there. Like, that's really small. Uh, you know, but she, on the other hand, like I literally had to have this conversation with her. If I wrap your gifts and put them under the tree, are you going to open them before Christmas? no answer. I'm like, I'm literally not going to put them under, because she'll fully admit, like, no, I'll probably go unwrap them beforehand just to see what's in them, because it's something in her she wants to know. It's, it's like, what am I getting? What am I receiving? She, from, from what she tells me, she did not pre-open any gifts, and I'm just going to choose to believe that this year. But Jesus says to this woman, he like, listen, there's a gift that's coming. There's a, there's a gift. If you knew the gift of God, You'd be asking me. Now, I, the woman doesn't know what it is at this point. Nobody knows what it is at this point. Jesus hasn't fulfilled the reason he came yet. But he's already alluding to the gift that God gives to us through his son. What we just celebrated this last week. The birth of a savior. The birth of the one who came to restore, to redeem, to bring forgiveness to broken lives to restore relationship with the God who created us. And so he's saying, man, if you knew the gift, you would be asking me for a drink. Now, the woman is just like, dude, I'm, I'm not following you. Because she says in verse 11, sir, the woman says, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. She's like, you don't have anything with you. How are you going to get water out of here? Where do you get this living water that you're talking about? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered her and said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. See, he's leading her on a conversation. He's like taking her down this trail. And she's confused, like, you're talking about, you don't even have anything. He says, hey, hey, listen, this well right here, I can take a drink of this. It's the middle of the day. I've been on a long journey. I'm thirsty. And we all know that feeling. You're exhausted from something, I don't know, exercise or walking up the stairs, maybe. I don't know. But you're just like, man, I just need water. I just need a drink. I can take a drink of this. And in a matter of time, I'm going to be thirsty again. It'll satisfy for a moment but it will not satisfy long-term. It will not satisfy completely. And we all have been there. Many of us have been there many times where we have that thought, man, if I could just fill in the blank, if I could just whatever it is for you, man, then I would be satisfied. Then I wouldn't thirst again. Then I would, I would have everything I'm wanting for, everything I'm hoping for. And we could fill in that blank for ourselves. Maybe it's, man, if I could just have that summer house where we could get away. Man, if I could just, guys, how many of you, man, if I could just have the Harley and just the roads on the weekend, free and clear. Maybe for some of this room, man, if I could just have better kids that didn't drive me crazy. Or maybe if I could just have a better spouse. Maybe if I could just have better friends. Maybe if I could just have the better job, the better position, the better role. Maybe if I could, whatever it is, we feel it thinking that's the one thing that's going to satisfy us. Man, some of you may have received something this last week that right now you're thinking, yeah, oh, I got my thing. It was under the tree. I'm going to be satisfied. And what Jesus is saying, listen, when we drink from that well, we're going to thirst again. We're going to thirst again. Because the truth is this, 
True satisfaction is found when we find the true source of satisfaction. And this is what Jesus is setting up in this whole conversation. The true satisfaction is found when we find the true source of satisfaction. There's a gift God is giving. And it's not found in this well that we drink from thinking, oh man, this will do it for me. This will do it for me. You see, Jesus goes on. He says, but whoever drinks of the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, well, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And I like, so she doesn't even fully maybe understand what's going on yet. But here's what's so beautiful about what she just said. She starts leaning into Jesus. And she starts leaning in because she's like, hey, if you've got something that means I don't have to come here in the middle of the day anymore. With all that's wrapped up in that, meaning if you've got something that will satisfy so that I'm not on the, on the sidelines of society anymore, I'm not an outcast from the group anymore, that I'm just not looking, man, if you've got that, I want that. Where can I get that? And some of us in this room, we relate to that because you, maybe you're sitting here today and you're like, man, Scott, I'll just be honest with you. I would not call myself a Christ follower and I'm not sure I believe in everything you guys talk about every week. But man, there's something that intrigues me and there's something that keeps drawing me back and I want to know more. That's where this woman is right now. Like, hey, I'm intrigued by this. I want to know more. And what's so beautiful about this is she leans into Jesus Jesus leans in to her. He says, verse 16, so he tells her, go, call your husband and come back. And her reply is, well, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now this just gets super personal, super personal. And some might even feel like that's kind of inappropriate. Like, Jesus, you did not need to go there. Because he begins to point out something about her life. Maybe this is the reason she's there in the middle of the day. Maybe this is the reason she's on the sideline of society for some reason. We don't know what the whole story is about the five husbands and, and the sixth guy. We don't, you know, maybe they passed away and she's just a woman of bad luck. Maybe she's promiscuous. We don't know. But Jesus man, begins to address a very sensitive place with her right away. And what he's immediately doing is illustrating to her this principle of that's the well she's been drinking from. Whatever is going on in her life, whatever is going on in this scenario with the men in her life, that's the well for her she's been drinking from, just like each one of us has a well. And as Jesus says, go call your husband, and her replies, well, I don't have one. He's like, right, you've got all these other guys. What he's pointing out to her is like, listen, you've been drawing from a well that doesn't satisfy, that will never satisfy you, to set her up for what he wants to bring to her. And here's what's beautiful about this. At this point, I have to imagine this. The woman is probably now bracing herself for, oh, I, I thought this conversation was going somewhere different, but... I know what comes now. What comes now is the condemnation. What comes now is the, all right, lay it on. It's what I go through every day. It's why I'm here right now. And yet Jesus doesn't condemn her. Jesus doesn't take this piece of information that he knows about her and begin to beat her with it. Because Jesus doesn't do that to us. The only people you see Jesus condemn in his lifetime were the religious the hypocrites, the people who wanted, you know, to put themselves in this position of no grace and no love. And those are the people, Jesus, Jesus doesn't condemn her, but he continues to lean into her. He says in verse 19, sir, the woman said, well, she responds back to him, I can see that you're a prophet. So conversation's awkward now, right? She goes, I can see that you're a prophet. You're telling me stuff about my life. I don't know how you know it, but you know it. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So, hey, when you get uncomfortable in a conversation, what's a great topic to switch to? 
Religion. Yeah, let's talk religion because that never gets awkward with people, right? So she switches like, hey, enough about me already. Let's talk about religion. And here's where she's going. So the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans decided, hey, if, if, you're, if the Jewish people aren't going to let us be a part of your worship and your culture, fine. We don't need you. We'll set up our own place of worship over here. So they worshiped in one place. The Jews had their temple in Jerusalem, and they worshiped in another place. And so she's like, well, then you tell me, where are we supposed to worship? Here's where Jesus shifts her and our understanding of worship. Jesus says to her in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is of the Jews. Here's the key. Catch this. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. You see, here's what God is saying to her. Her question is, where's the place? Where's the place that we're supposed to go worship? And along with that, there's the posture and there's the presentation, right? But where's the right one? And Jesus says, hey, hey, it's not about that anymore. It's not about the place. It's not about the posture. It's not about the presentation anymore, although those are all still included. But Jesus says God is now looking for something different. God is now looking for a person. God is now looking for a worshiper. God is now looking for someone who doesn't just want to draw a circle around an event and say, okay, I did it, check that off the list. Okay, I came, 10 a.m. service, I can, you know, still get kickoff, you know, and I can still make it here, I can still do that. Done it, I've worshipped for my week. Jesus is shifting this concept, this understanding, this view of worship from an event that took place to a person that God is looking for. And it's a person who worships in spirit and in truth, Jesus says. You see, when we worship, when when we become the people and lean into the people that God wants us to be, it envelops all of who we are. And this concept of our spirit, it's this concept of it's our heart, it's our will, it's our emotions. And some of you are like, the emotional thing, I'm not sure about that. And I kind of relate to that because I'm not this highly emotional person, right? I was a worship leader for a a few years, and I, I had a person come up to me once and say, hey, you need to smile more when you lead worship. Why? Why do I need to smile? Because that's what worship leaders do. You need to smile more when you lead. I'm like, I'm trying to breathe. Wait, wait, I see there's like a lot of air coming out there. You know, I'm concentrating on stuff. And I was never like this highly expressive person, right? Um, my, my brother pastored a church for a while uh, in Antioch, long, long, long time ago. And his was the kind of church where, man, they would literally, like, be running the aisle. Like, I'm not kidding, running the aisles and hooping and hollering and stuff like that. And I would just kind of stand there and go, whoa, this is because that's just not me. And for some of us, you know, when it comes to, like, the songs we're singing and people are like, oh, and you're just like, oh, okay, I'm not sure what to do with my hands right now. Because, you know, but this concept of worship and spirit, it's the concept of all we are. It's even our emotions brought into it. Now, that doesn't mean you have to become highly emotional when you worship God or anything like, but we also don't withhold our emotions. We also don't withhold the spirit inside of us, our spirit responding to the spirit of God. But he also balances that with truth. It's the reason we gather together every Sunday to know God through his word. Hey, what does God say about himself? How does God want to be? Who is he? he? Because knowing that will cause worship inside of us. And so there's this balance of spirit and truth. And God is saying, Jesus is saying, God is looking for that worshiper, that person who's going to worship with spirit, with all that they are, withholding nothing from God in the truth of who God is and in the truth of who he's revealed himself to be and, and how he wants to worship. And God is looking for that person. Because God isn't looking for a place a posture, and simply a presentation anymore. He wants the person that will encompass all of that. And here's the danger for us. You see, our sometimes very myopic view of worship being just song and music, the danger for us is that we've made worship a playlist rather than a presentation of self. 
We've made worship something, you know, we put on in the car when we're commuting to work so I don't totally flesh out on everybody around me as I drive. Like, you know, Jesus, I am who you say I am, but annihilate that person for cutting me off. And, you know, it's like, Lord, just call me. Okay, I get to work, turn off my playlist, and I go on with the rest of my day. That's the danger for us in a limited view of worship. And what Jesus is saying is, no, it's an all-encompassing presentation of who we are. Louis Giglio, who he, he's a pastor and an author, he defined worship this way, and I thought it was beautiful. He said, worship is our response to God for who he is and what he has done, expressed in and by the things we say and the way we live. So what does this mean for us? This encounter Jesus had, what he expresses to her about, what does this mean for us? Well, Paul, another author of the New Testament, he put it this way in Romans chapter 12. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see, the people of the Old Testament knew that when they took something to God, when they went to that place, when they brought their presentation to God, whatever they put on the altar, it stayed there. It wasn't theirs anymore. It was God's. And Jesus is saying in this shift of worship, when God is looking for the type of person, he's looking for the person who's going to put themselves on that altar and say, God, I'm yours. All of me. All of me. That verse of Paul's that we just read, let me read it to you in the message. The message is a paraphrase of the Bible, but it's beautiful how it's, he says this. Here's how the message writes it. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. You see, worship in the Old Testament was a sacrificial system. And Jesus says, worship now is a sacrifice of self. Because God is looking for the person. So, this is the time of the year, right, where we make resolutions, where we make goals. Some of you are maybe big resolution people. Other of you are like, "Um, why even make them? I never follow any of them. I fall somewhere in between, right? Maybe it's resolutions. Maybe it's goals, whatever. As you do that, if you do that, if you're not that kind of person, I'm still going to ask you to do this. Here's my challenge for you this week. To take some time to answer three questions, to get a little introspective, but to take some time and answer these three questions. And the first one is this. What or who am I giving more value in my life than Jesus? What or who am I giving more value in my life than Jesus? If worship is defined as what we put our value into, our focus on, our attention, what or who am I giving more value in my life to than Jesus? The second question is this. What am I allowing to keep me from offering all that I am to Jesus? What am I allowing to keep me from offering all that I am to Jesus? Maybe it's your, you know, 10-year family plan or professional plan or the goals or this or or who knows what it may be. It's, It's different for each one of us. But what am I allowing to keep me from offering all that I am to Jesus? Lord, I'm yours. Every single part of me, I'm yours. Now, If we're honest with those first two, the third one will be kind of self-evident. If we're honest with those first two, God will lead us into the third one. But the third one would be this. If worshiping God in spirit and truth is my priority, what would need to change in my life? If worshiping God in spirit and truth are my priority, what would need to change in my life? Now, if we ask and answer these questions honestly for ourselves... God will point out the third one. We'll know the third one. We'll know what it is. And then it's, it's, 
a choice. It's simply a choice meant, God, I, I want to be the worshiper that you're looking for. I want to give you all. I want, and let me just balance it with this, because this happens a lot in church too. That does not mean, oh man, I'm going to have to give up everything. I'm going to have to quit this. I'm gonna, maybe some of that might be involved. Maybe none of that will be involved. Maybe it's just an inner shift of the will, of the focus from me focus to God focus. It might simply be that. God may also ask you, like, you need to let go of some stuff. He'll lead you there. But don't not do this. There's a great double negative for you. Don't not do this simply because you think, oh, that means I'm just going to have to quit everything. It might not mean that. But God will show you. But if you do this, if you take the time to do this over this next week, I'll guarantee you this because it's not dependent on my, it's dependent on God. I'll guarantee you this. It will radically reshape your relationship with God in the next year. If you give him everything, placing yourself as the offering and become that worshiper in spirit and in truth. Let's pray. I think it would be fair to say, Lord, that most of us in this room, we would say that our heart's desire is to be that worshiper that you're looking for. Lord, every one of us, we struggle with different stuff that can take, you know, the focus off of you at times or, you know, hey, we've given you this part of us, but we've kind of withheld this part for whatever reason. And Lord, my prayer for all of us is that as we would set aside time this next week to sit with those questions, to sit with you, to allow you to kind of help us work through those things, the resistance maybe we have on the inside, the hesitation to let go of certain things, and simply go, Lord, we want to be the worshiper that you're looking for. What's holding me back from being that? That you would lead us to that place of, Lord, maybe for some, it's complete submission to you in every aspect of life. Maybe for some, it's, the first step of submission, of even a relationship with you. But that you would give us clarity and honesty and authenticity, Lord, and then the courage to step into this new year as a worshiper that you're looking for, spirit and in truth, all that we are. Lord, thank you for uh, your grace with us in that process. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Just a moment. The worship leader is going to lead us in a song that I would love for us to kind of like be our cry at the end of this year that as we're surrounded by a creation that is worshiping God, that our cry would be, so will I. So will I. I will be that worshiper also. So in just a moment, they'll lead us.